our next presenters will be our education and transition group. So our first presenter in this group is Ray. Hi, thank you, Selena. Uh, my name is Ray Bauer. I use they, them pronouns. I'm majoring in sociology with a thematic minor in diversity in education. Um, I want to quickly preface my presentation. I will be using identity first language because it's the language I'm most comfortable using as a disabled person amongst other members of the disability community as well. Uh, my personal language preference is not meant to be representative of language preferences of the disability community as a whole, their allies, the University of Arizona, USED, or the Disability Cultural Center. So the original intention of working on this event was to explain general transition processes, gather resources for students, um, but it really kind of evolved into becoming about how laws and transition plans and individual college accommodation processes work. Um, rather than easily finding straightforward answers, I ended up spending a significant amount of time dissecting nuance, looking at laws, seeing the difference between IEP and 504 plans, uh, and then searching for what resources did exist among colleges to the extent that I was even call, calling college disability representatives to find out this information. Um, so it kind of evolved into this, this dissection of laws and transition plans and individual college accommodation processes. Um, there was a lot of time that instead of, you know, easily finding these straightforward answers, I was spending a significant, significant amount of time dissecting nuance looking at laws, uh, seeing the difference between IEPs and 504 plans, and then searching for what resources did exist among these colleges. Um, what I kind of realized in all of this is the information on disability related topics are not very accessible. Arizona colleges and their resources, their procedures also vary widely. So one example of this was that some colleges had wheelchair accessible on-campus transportation, and then some didn't have any campus transportation. Um, in terms of accommodation processes, these also varied widely. Some colleges required students to have medical documentation of their disabilities in order to receive any accommodations. Other colleges determined accommodation needs almost solely based on one-on-one -on -one meeting with a disability resources faculty member. And then they only recommended, but did not require this medical documentation. Uh, so also this, this information was the crucial information that students needed to know and was relevant to them were very difficult to get. So in reaction to this realization, I created a presentation that broke down the high school to college process into steps. I created a printable PDF brochure with each college's resources their disability accommodations page and their contact information for each of the colleges that were um, included in this event. The presentation I worked on will be given at an event hosted by the University of Arizona's Disability Cultural Center for the Tempe Union High School District's students and their families. The printable PDF brochure will be given to these students and to the attendees at another DCC event uh, which is called the UADCC Student Transition Symposium. And then after these two events, the DCC will be making this information publicly available to anyone who's interested. Um, so overall, it was a great experience to work on this project. And I think for those of us in the academic community, we really need to have more of these projects and events like these to make this information more accessible to students that will help make them successful in, or help them be successful in higher education as a whole. Thanks, Ray. Um, does anyone have any immediate questions? Some comments? Yumi says, nice work. Okay, there's nothing else. Great job. Um, 
Oh, there is a question. Uh, Ray, do you work with the Transition Ahead Roundtable? I do not. Um, I just recently found out about them uh, just because I've been super busy, but it is something I'm looking into. Okay. All right, we'll go ahead and move on and uh, Ray be ready for any questions that might come at the end of this section, okay? Thank you. Natty Rico says, awesome working with you. Our next presenter is Alyssa. Hello, everyone. My name is Alyssa Gandalf, and I am a senior right now at the University of Arizona, graduating soon with my degrees in political science and education. And I have been extremely lucky this semester and the past one to be a disability policy fellow. So um, today I'm going to be talking a little bit about disproportionality in special education and um, some of the conflicts surrounding it. Um, but what is disproportionality? So disproportionality is the tendency of students for students of certain racial and ethnic groups to be over-identified for special education services, placed in more restrictive settings and disciplined more severely. So when I was first looking at this um, question, whether there is disproportionality in special education, I came across conflicting views. I saw that the Department of Education had reported zero disproportionality in special education in 2019. But when I was talking to advocates and special education teachers and people in the community, this seemed to just not be the case. So I went and looked to find what could be causing this. And it seemed that it was a lack of data and incomplete data within Arizona. So what I found was that over 700 public and charter schools or about 36% of Arizona schools had reported zero 504 plans to the CRDC. And when these schools were contacted, they said um, about 42% of them said that the data was incorrect. So while the Arizona Department of Education is required to collect the data and report it to the CRDC, they're not required to verify this data. And that is extremely important because we really need to have accurate special education identification figures, as well as placement disparity and um, whether children um, with certain um, disabilities and ethnic and racial backgrounds are being disciplined at higher or more severe rates. Um, so why does that matter? Overrepresentation of students of color with disabilities can indicate bias within the system. For example, um, black students are more likely to be identified with um, intellectual and learning disabilities and um, while um, or intellectual and developmental disabilities. And on the other hand, underrepresentation can be a sign of lower resources and support within the community. So black students are less likely to be identified with autism nationally, um, which is um, interesting because in Arizona, autism is one of the most, um, they have one of the most funded programming um, in the state. So that is definitely something to consider in terms of where is the funding going and are students of color being considered um, in this. And so for policy recommendations, the Arizona Department of Education should be required to collect data on identification, placement, and disciplinary actions across both race and ethnicity identity, but also type of disability. And then they should be required to verify this data with the schools and ensure reporting compliance. Furthermore, um, the, when these results are compared across rates and ethnicity and type of disability and areas of overrepresentation and underrepresentation are identified, then these should be reported to the public in clear language. And finally, um, they should be required to um, comply with the law and say that not only should a part, a percentage of the IDEA Part B funding be cut to schools that are identified with disproportionality, but also that a plan is in place to correct this. 
but um, those are just some of the recommendations I have for um, any of our policymakers. And please feel free to ask any questions. I would love to hear them. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alyssa. I'll give it a second to see if anyone has a question. Um, I have a question, if you don't mind. Uh, I'll start with Thank you. Um, so uh, what it sounds like, Alyssa, is that uh, the implicit bias of the, of the instructor plays a role in how folks with disabilities get placed. Um, sorry, can you repeat the last part of your question? Okay. Um, implicit bias on the part of the instructor and how a person with disabilities uh, can get either placed into a category or how they, how they may not. And then also, um, did you do any further um, um, research on what the issue is with people with autism or potentially with autism and uh, race? So as for the implicit bias, um, I think that one of the big problems is that without the clear data to show that there is disproportionality, there's not a lot of training out there for teachers on um, how to identify and what the maybe discrepancies and biases might be within their community. Mm -hmm. um, so without kind of this data to show that there is a problem, no one is really saying that there's a problem and there's no kind of solution to fix it. So then if teachers um, are kind of seeing there's a problem, but there's no training out there or um, it's not a universal training, then um, it's kind of difficult to, um, in Arizona at least, to kind of fix this um, issue with implicit bias. And um, for the second portion in the autism, um, I haven't done much research specifically on um, autism and how it relates, but I have um, heard from like, for instance, um, one of the members in my cohort, Katie, she was talking about um, how um, students were um, just trying, like parents with resources were trying to get their um, students um, into, even if they weren't identified with autism, but they had perhaps a different disability um, that they were trying to help them get a diagnosis with autism because of those necessary resources that were being given there. But I haven't um, really delved into um, how autism is um, connected with disproportionality. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Thank you. A couple questions in the chat. Um, although this was not looked at in this specific study, do you believe there may be a connection to disproportionality and the school to prison pipeline phenomenon? Um, yes, I definitely think that there is a connection there. Um, I've also done a little bit of work within um, school segregation and contemporary school segregation. And um, I've seen that Black students are significantly more likely to um, be disproportionately put into the school to prison pipeline. And this is especially prevalent with um, students with disabilities. So um, I think that there is certainly a connection there. Um, although I didn't really delve into it here, um, I have seen a few studies on it, but um, I think it's really um, something that should be looked into more in Arizona specifically as well. One other question, while you were looking for disproportionality, did you notice a difference between charter, public, private schools, and the amount of resources? I didn't specifically look into, um, I know that charter and public schools were both looked at, 
within um it was the azcir um they were the reporters on looking at the um 504 plan discrepancies and they were looking at both public and charter schools and the um, results were um, both for public and charter schools that there was disproportionality um, and or that the 504 plans weren't being collected and that could be indicative of disproportionality um, but I'm not sure about private schools um, that would certainly be an interesting area just because they don't receive the state funding or the um, as much uh, state interaction there. So I think um, perhaps that would be something to look into on whether um, how policies impact across schools. Um, but I know we have one more question, but um, I'm going to hold it till the end of the section so we can get to our next presenter. So um, Alyssa, you'll have one more after. Perfect, this thank okay. you. Okay. Perfect, thank you all so much. All right, our next presenter is Katie. Hi, my name is uh, Katie Kwiatkowski. I'm a graduate student um, getting uh, my master's degree in applied behavior and analysis, and I'm part of the disability uh, policy fellowship. Um, I became interested in it when um, I was looking at my degree and I was uh, wondering why uh, BCBAs are not common in schools and how I could go about and change that. So that's um, in when I started doing the research and started looking, I see I started seeing major uh, problems with the transitioning from school to work. Um, we went, we met with Ronaldo, uh, and he spoke to us about how that's an area of concern for many of the parents. Um, in my own in the research and uh, in talking with parents myself, uh, their lives after school is a major uh, concern. Um, transition plans are part of an IEP. Um, it's required by IDEA um, or IDEA there to assist the student transition to school um, from school part to school part and then then help them transition into the workforce or further education, whatever that may be. Um, when I started looking at the research, 17.9% uh, of all people uh, with disabilities were currently employed. Um, 32% uh, attended post-secondary education schools, and 80% were still living with their parents, and only 36% had their driver's license. I also found more data that uh, people with disabilities make 60 set, 66 cents per dollar of that of someone without a disability, which I found quite scary. Um, uh, you said had done um, a research and they found the number one concern for both students and parents was uh, with disabilities was gainful employment after high school. Um, I started looking at what could be changed, what could be addressed within the schools to make these changes, uh, to make this transition, um, this transition process more helpful to students, um, giving them broad experience, more broad experience and stuff and, and, and along those lines. Um, and so I included four areas of what can be changed during the tra during these transition meetings, um, providing more and better work opportunities for students with disabilities. One of my experiences um, with you said was helping uh, students with disabilities make a um, a uh, uh, like apply for jobs and make a resume. Um, I, both students I talked to uh, could could not give me much valid work experience they had experienced at schools. I know schools um, often need office work. Uh, many schools have daycares that are available for um, students to work at. My own daughter is part of an engineering pro uh, program in high school. She's also volunteering regularly. Uh, I've not. Obviously, these areas are not reaching students in special education as they are with students without a disability. Um, so one area is providing multiple work um, opportunities for students as early as starting high school and, and around the high school, also making community partnerships. Um, 
figuring out what a community needs and helping students with uh, work experience in those areas. Um, the next area to change would be making these a better transition plan, beginning it, begin the transition earlier. Right now, what is required is at age 16, and that's what I find most people begin the transition process is at age 16. We've already lost years of looking and practicing and working that like they could have had before that. One other area is a major one. It's addressing transportation. Since there's such a low amount of driver's license uh, availability, addressing transportation in the IEP meeting so students know how they're going to get to work and uh, in, in that area. Next, empowering the student, really like listening to them. When they start high school, have them find something to get involved in, whether that would be something like a key club or a volunteer club or any or work experience in the school or um, the, any of those areas, making that available to them right off the bat like it is to all other students um, and actually encouraging uh, that to all students, um, really pushing that and uh, encouraging activity memberships to everything. Um, I think that in one way. And the last one is, and I mentioned it before, is making connections between uh, community and students with disabilities. Um, connecting parents in those IEP meetings to outreach programs, uh, such as you said, or, and there's many others out there. Also bringing in companies. I live in Casa Grande. We have a brand new uh, car, uh, company that just opened up here um, that are, is employing massive amounts of people, figuring out how to make connections with that to employ, to give gainful employment. Um, I did go into on mine uh, more about touching base with education as well. I don't think it should just be work experience, but I kind of wanted to focus on that because that was what I had seen. But in my actual brief, I do touch on secondary uh, education and that as well. Um, are there any questions? Thanks, Katie. Um, we can take maybe one or two questions and then um, we'll move to the next one. And then if you have any additional questions at the end. Uh, Ray has a comment. Yes, I totally agree that an IEP transition to adulthood plan should be mandated sooner. Though many might not be sure of what they want to do at age 16, there should be discussion sooner to help prepare them for whatever they choose to do. I totally agree. I think even, even if we're not telling them what they're going to be doing, I think um, touching that base and giving them opportunities to see what else out, is out there and what they can do. Um, I when I was working with the USAID students, many of them were like, I love working with animals and I love animals. And, you know, they knew that, you know, and helping them get involved in maybe a volunteer program. We have another comment, great information. We need more resources to help others make smooth transition. Uh, Transition Ahead Roundtable does a great job of incorporating all the suggested changes necessary to improve transitioning from high school to adulthood that you mentioned. Um, and then you do have another question, but I'm going to hold it till the, the end of this section. Okay, Katie? Okay. I'll come back. Thank you. Okay, our last presenter from this section is Heidi. Hello, my name is Heidi Saxton. Um, I am an education and English major and undergraduate at the U of A. I'm part of the interdisciplinary approach to disability and professional practice intern, but I'm also a student worker at the USAID. So I work with the employment team at the USAID and there are a lot of different projects. I am familiar with Project Search, but mostly I work on the work-based learning experience. So my presentation is about the impacts and the impacts that I've seen. And I was trying to dig up some data from what I've actually participated in. And unfortunately, there wasn't 
that much since I've only been participating for about a year, but I still want to, I'll go over that when I get to the methods and results section. But so introduction, what is work-based learning? So the idea of work-based learning is to partner with local high schools. So right now we're working with um, Intermountain Academy, uh, CDO. We have a couple of schools in the Amphi School District. And the goal is to take those kids, those students with disabilities out into the community and get them work experience. Um, they usually go during school hours for about the length of one period. So like an hour. And then they have a vocational specialist, which would be me or the other people on my team and a person from the school staff that goes with them. So the idea is that work-based learning will prepare those students for competitive integrated employment. And I'm so glad that I got to go after Katie because I think our projects uh, work really well together. Um, competitive integrated employment is a goal for basically everybody. I mean, everybody wants to get paid. Everybody, I mean, most people want to work and it should be equitable. Individuals with disabilities should be able to get the same jobs that non um, individuals without disabilities have access to. So that's like my passion project. And I was really excited to present on it. So the background from the research I did, I found that work can provide individuals with disabilities a sense of purpose, increased self-esteem and connections with peers. I have seen this firsthand from the students I work with. I experienced this firsthand, even though I don't identify as someone with a disability, I had really bad anxiety in high school. And as I like got up and started working, a lot of that improved for me. It took a lot of time, but getting a job made a big difference. And I imagine that if I sat here and asked all of you to give your opinions, you would end up saying something similar. Even the worst job experience, you still learn something, you still grow. And I think individuals with disabilities should have access to that as well. So the question is, how do we get individuals with disabilities is it Heidi that froze or is it me no she's frozen for me as well okay I was, I was afraid it was me no, me also. Yeah, she's frozen for me as well. We'll give her a second to see if she's able to pop back in. While we're checking in on Heidi, um, Selena, do you want to maybe we can ask our other questions and I'll see if I can get in touch with her sure. that we had for our other, um, we can kind of go to the Q&A and then come back to Heidi. Sure, okay. So let's go back. Let's see if we can. Okay, so I think this question was for Alyssa. Uh, from Brandy, were you able to review data related to the suspension and expulsion rates of children of color with disabilities? So, um, yes, I did review some of the national data. Um, the um, individual for Arizona, it was a bit harder to parse um, because there's just not a lot of data out there. But um, nationally, um, it, I found that Black students were significantly more likely um, to um, be um, disciplined at more severe rates and um, at higher rates. And I think I was looking at the statistic that I saw, and it was per total um, disciplinary students of 100 students with disabilities, it was 65 black students that were in that total. 
and um, that was compared to 26 white students or 24 Hispanic and Latino. Um, and um, um, Amer um, Native American students were also high with 27 um, um, compared to um, Hispanic and Latino and white. But um, I suspect that in certain areas, the um, um, Native American population may be higher and it might also be an issue with um, data. But um, I hope that answers your question. And I also have um, a good resource for um, this information if you would like me to post it in the chat. Perfect. That Thank would be you, great. Alyssa. Thanks, Alyssa. Mm -hmm. We have um, we have Heidi back. So we can go back. Uh, Heidi, if you're able to. Yes, I am so, okay, so, so, so sorry. <laughs> I don't know what happened. It just my internet cuts out about once a day, but it already happened this morning. So I thought it would not happen this afternoon. I guess I was wrong. Um, how far into the background section did I get for you guys? Did I finish the first bullet point? Yes, um, I think so. Yeah. Okay. So um, individuals with developmental disabilities are less likely to be, to get into competitive and integrated employment. So the idea is how do we fix that? Um, research has shown that um, there are certain services that help increase the likelihood of an individual with a disability participating in competitive and integrated employment later on in life. So um, there are uh, vocational training, so that, that can be um, job skills. We do a few workshops every uh, other week with the employment team where we talk about, about important work skills. Um, and then job placement services. So that's basically supported employment where a vocational specialist will go to a job site with an individual with a disability and support them through the work. And that's often associated with folk rehab, but we try to um, do that earlier in high school and intervene earlier. So the actual research that I did, um, we have about 20 students participating uh, who are amazing. At the beginning of the semester, we had everybody fill out a survey about, um, it's like, what are your fears about work? How do you feel about self-advocacy on a scale of one to 10? And they answered questions like that. Um, so some of the biggest concerns for students across the board were being prepared for work, and that included personal hygiene. So I work closely with a lot of um, students with autism, and most of them reported being concerned about getting ready for work in the morning. They're also worried about self-advocating, so asking for breaks, asking for what they need, et cetera. And that, I mean, we've seen it today. Everybody in the disability community can talk about how important self-advocacy is. Um, and then learning new tasks, so getting outside of their comfort zone, um, that was also really scary and knowing their strengths. So I think this really ties into what Katie was saying about how a lot of students don't know what they want to do, don't know what they're good at, are worried, stressed out, all this other stuff. And the idea is that we come in, we do a student interview at the beginning of the semester, find out what they like, and then put them in a job and see what they're good at and see what their weaknesses are, because um, everybody has those. So because we are only, we're almost done with the semester, I only had about 50% of the surveys completed for the end of the semester to see how everybody was feeling. And there was a significant improvement in self-advocating. Students felt like they had a, had really strengthened that skill. And then um, knowing their strengths and knowing what they're good at. And those are two things that I learned at my first job. And I, like I said, I imagine if we asked everybody on this call, they would agree they learned similar skills on their first job. There were mild improvements in um, being prepared for work and personal hygiene and learning new tasks. It was the same, same level. Um, for challenges, it's hard to get school staff to participate. I mean, oftentimes they're, they're busy, they're underpaid, they have a lot going on. And it's hard to kind of pitch this idea of, hey, we know that education is important, but have you thought about employment? 
because it's I think it's um, difficult for people, especially school staff, to have time to think about the next steps. So um, and then many students feelings about work change over time, which makes it hard to identify concrete results. For example, if you give them this survey after the best day at work they've ever had, they're just going to report higher. And if they just had a really bad day for whatever reason, um, something outside of work, external factors, they may just rate themselves lower. So um, getting a higher uh, sample size, obviously, would make this way more accurate. But I think this is a good starting point. And then increasing student participation in pre and post assessments. So at the beginning of the semester and at the end of the semester, everything's really hectic. It's hard to get everybody to do all the paperwork. And we really, I really struggled with that this semester. Um, so just increasing that as well would make it easier to identify results. And then for future work, one of the resources that I found said that training of coworkers and getting um, in working with individuals with developmental disabilities was related to better outcomes for wages and integration in the workplace. So right now, um, our vocational specialists go out and try to find job sites that match the goals of the student and the goals of our program. But we don't have a lot of time or a lot of staff to sit down and do like a training with the entire staff and tell them who, uh, what the students are, what their roles are. We usually have a sit down with the supervisor and that's about it. So it would be nice if we had more time to work on improving the workplaces. And what I've found is that the longer we work with one business, which happens, we've had a lot of repeat businesses over the few years that the work-based learning program has been active, um, they are usually better at workplace environment and they're more comfortable working with the students. And um, lastly, that little picture in the right corner is two of the students that I work with most frequently. They are both stationed at the Reed Park Zoo and I just, they're probably our biggest success stories. Obviously I can't share any personal information, but I don't know. I think the, if you look, you can't really see under the masks, they are smiling. I think the results speak for themselves. Um, if anybody has any questions, I can take this now or when we go to our big group thing. Thanks Heidi. Um, we'll go ahead and we'll, we'll do, you were the last of that section. So we'll just do Q and A for everyone. So, um, We'll, we'll continue with the questions that uh, for, for everyone in this section. Do we have any questions for Heidi? You can put them in the chat or raise your hand and unmute. I think we did get a comment for Heidi earlier from Amber. As a former instructional aide for deaf and hard of hearing high school students, I can attest that work-based programs did wonders for their self-esteem and gave them hope for getting jobs during and after high school. I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Was that a question? <laughs> no, it was just a comment. Uh, Amber is kind of attesting that um, that she was also an instructional aide for uh, deaf and hard of hearing students and that it really did wonders on their self-esteem and gave them hope for working after high school. It's incredibly empowering. I mean, work is for everybody, regardless of your ability, identity, anything like that. So it's important that they have access to everything that everybody else has access to. And Katie also had a comment. I love what you're doing. Can I reach out to you for what works and doesn't? I'm moving to teach high school next year and would love to speak with you about it. Absolutely. I am a big proponent of um, this program and I would I could talk about it for hours. I can put my email in the, in the Zoom chat for you. Selena, did we get to John Meyer's question from earlier? I don't think so. Okay. So I, this one, I believe, is also for uh, Alyssa. There we go. 
What are your next steps with respect to getting state action on this issue? How will you pursue adoption of your recommendations? Yeah, I think this is definitely like a question I was looking back on um, throughout and it was, it's really difficult, I think, to think about getting state action because um, we are trying, like when we met, for instance, we all met with um, some of our state legislators and that was some really meaningful conversations. And um, we talked a lot about things like SSI and um, helping individuals with disabilities gain employment and all these things. And um, some of the, and all of these things were extremely important, um, but it was kind of difficult to think about getting um, movement in terms of the disproportionality issue when um, we were trying to focus on some of our other issues. And um, it, so it kind of, it's difficult to get movement on it. However, um, I am really passionate about it and I would love to continue working with the USED and hopefully get some traction and um, get, keep educating people on this, get people to care about this, and then hopefully get some movement. So I don't know, um, definitely if JC or um, Dr. Edgen have any <laughs> recommendations for how to um, get this out there, I would love to continue working on it. Yeah, so um, I, just to comment on the meetings with the legislature, that was because we were at a nationwide meeting, right? Like, so that those are our, um, our representatives in Congress on the national level. So this is the kind of thing that, you know, it's an Arizona Department of Education issue, it's a local control school issue. Um, so there's some things that have to come back to the Arizona um, and, and, and putting this brief out is super important. So I've already just sent an email to JC that we've got to do it ASAP. <laughs> so we're going to do that and see what evolves from it. So, <laughs> so important that I sent an email just now. <laughs> so good work. <laughs> we'll, we'll move on from there then. <laughs> Thank you all for the questions. And we have one final question for Heidi, and then we'll move on to our um, last category. So Ray asked, did they say anything specifically about their anxiety um, about self-advocacy, such as being resource-based anxiety, unsure of what laws there are, and how to act if they encounter discrimination or perhaps just having to do with self-esteem? So I wasn't present for every assessment so I can only speak for the students that I was there with um, for the most part a lot of it was self-esteem issues combined with resource-based anxiety I wouldn't say many of them were concerned about laws or discrimination in the sense of I'm worried about discrimination more um, general than that I think a lot of these students were worried that um, I mean, the same anxieties that I had when I first, when I got my first job, are they going to like me? Am I going to be good at it? What, um, what happens if I get fired? So I don't, uh, obviously, because they are individuals with disabilities, some of those questions have a different connotation than an individual without a disability asking them. But I would say that it's, uh, resource-based, not necessarily having to do with laws, more so because they are just generally unaware of what laws protect them and what don't. And I actually think that's a, a great thing to add to the transition program is just talking about what your rights are. So thank you for bringing that up. I will mention that at the next team meeting. And then um, I definitely think a lot of it is self-esteem based. <laughs> 